Hey everybody, welcome and I hope you've had a good week. Uh, today the 7th of June, uh, continuing with our, our walk with the Lord and uh, yeah, learning quite a, little bit, quite a lot about the Holy Spirit and the works thereof during uh, the beginning, the Old Testament, Salvation and the New Testament. And as you, or as we, continue our walk, uh, I, uh, I've got a, a few verses that I'd like to share with you and just look a little bit deeper into them during the time that we're that we're in at the moment whilst continuing to to walk close with the lord so i'd like to open up in prayer heavenly father we thank you for this time we thank you for what you are doing in each and every one of us lord open our hearts make our hearts tender and soft to hear what you have to say through your word and also to be able to minister to us in our private time um, but give us the opportunities to give thanks to you uh, in all circumstances to give praise and glory uh, for, for what you uh, have done and who you are and what you will be doing. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together and we give you all the praise and glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's been a, a good week of uh, tucking into the Word and learning more about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. And last week we touched on a few things with regards to Joel as well as Acts. And we're going to just take it another step further and look at the next few little uh, verses within them because uh, I think it's quite important I, I, I was going to uh, do another book but I just felt it in my heart to continue with the with the next little sections that we that we looked at so last week we looked at God's Spirit uh, being poured out amongst all nations and if you recall it said that he would show his wonders and heavens in the earth and uh, blood and fire and pillars of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great Lord, uh, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let's take it a little bit further. Okay, we're looking at um, uh, Joel chapter 3. And we're going to look at a couple of verses. I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you because there are 16, uh, sorry, um, 21 verses in them. So I'm just going to jump around a little bit and uh, go into a little bit of the, the beginning of uh, Joel chapter 3. And then moving into the middle and uh, more to the end. And then I'll just go into to, to, to explain uh, the, the verses and uh, maybe in your own uh, way you can be able to see how that is applicable today and where we are. So uh, Joel chapter 3 talks about, this is shortly after God's Spirit being poured out. So you know we've been through Pentecost, you know that the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples over 2,000 years ago. But then the Holy Spirit moved and he's amongst all the believers, amongst all flesh like he said. But then he also went on to, Joel, the, the prophet, went on to talk about God's judgment on the nations. And um, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a somber read, um, but it's also an opportunity for us to be able to see where we're at, not just individually, but also corporately and uh, throughout the, the nations and the world. And it just gives us an insight as to, um, you know, just keeping, keeping our eyes attuned and ears attuned to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us during this time. So I'm taking it from verse 1. For behold, in the days that, uh, the, for the for in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them uh, there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations. They have also divided up my land. So let's look at those two verses to start off with. When it talks about in those days, it points back to what we read about last week between uh, Joel chapter 2 verses 28 to 32 being God's Spirit being poured out. It begins an explanation of exactly how the judgments of the Lord on the nations will, will be carried out. And the captives contextually are those in Judah and Israel. And uh, the answer to verse 2 which show uh, whom they have scattered amongst the nations in a, broad, in a broader sense some scholars interpret it as applying to dispersed Jews returning uh, to a restored end times Israel um, and it's quite an interesting read that because uh, you know we are looking at a time where uh, it, it could either be um, the, the, the dispersed Jews returning to, to uh, the, the restored end times Israel but it could also be a symbolic uh, symbolically referring to the church and it's basically Joel saying that um, you know <laughs> we've looked at so many beautiful books in the Bible like the book of Hosea, where you know Israel were, were, were not uh, seeking God, um, but Hosea, as with Gomer, 
being the, 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 the harlot and he loved to, you know, loved to just as much as God loves Israel. He kept his, uh, his love open to them for them to turn back to him so that he can withhold the judgment and pour out his blessing. Um, but then in Joel, it's talking specifically about the, 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 the end times of Israel, bringing the people back home. So in other words, the people of Israel is a symbol, uh, it's symbolic to the church, to everybody to come back into his loving arms and to be able to, uh, to, to, to worship him in spirit and truth in an in a, in a individual basis, in a corporate basis, just like the people of Israel were scattered all over the nations and they had, had dispersed and the Lord is now calling them back home. He's calling them back into the end times. So uh, that's the first little section that I wanted to read for you. Then uh, the next section I wanted to read is taken from chapter 3 verses 11 and I'm going to take it from 11 through to uh, 17. And uh, it says, Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit and judge all the surrounding nations. Put in a sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for that day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will go, grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will also roar from Zion and utter the voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be the shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no alien shall ever pass through her again. So let's have a look at what, what this all means. Let's have a look at the Valley of Jehoshaphat. In Jewish tradition, it's thought to be part of a, a Kidron Valley between the Temple and the Mount of Olives. Uh, Jehoshaphat means uh, Yahweh is, is judged, so our Lord Jesus Christ is judged. This, therefore, may be a symbolic place of judgment and decision rather than an actual place in, in Joel's mind. So basically what it's saying is that people may, in a, may be in a, in a season of, of decision, of being able to decide which is going to be a, a, a fruitful way that will honor the Lord in, in, in their walk. It's almost like a bit of a um, coming to a T-junction and uh, saying, OK, Lord, you are wanting me to go this way, so I'm going to go this way, or are you wanting me to go this way? So it's a value of uh, decision, um, which then allows them to be able to come into a place to see what the Lord is wanting to do, which is uh, be what it says in, in chapter 16, uh, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, because it's, we are called back to Jerusalem. And, it, and, and you know what, while he's talking about calling the people back to Israel in Jerusalem, he's got to be meeting us up in the clouds. So I want to have a look at a couple of uh, verses here and just to dig into them a little bit. It says here, um, your mighty ones, in verse 11, it says your mighty ones, they're the heroes of God, or the heavenly armies which carry out his bidding. So you and I as believers, we stay in the word, we intercede, we've looked at interceding this week, about praying in the spirit so that the Lord may be able to be honored and glorified, and how we can partner with him to be able to make that difference. And sometimes it may not seem that it might be uh, the, the, the Lord's will, but the Lord ultimately will direct your path. It talks about uh, the harvest is ripe and the wine press is full. It re refers to the fact that nations are ripe for God's judgment. And these figures are also used for the last judgment of God in Re Revelation 4. If we've got uh, a bit of time, we'll go into that today. The multitudes, which can be translated into tumult, and refers to the noisy multitudes following in the valley of decision, the place of God's final, final verdict. Then verse 16 it says, It's only to the enemies that the Lord is terribly uh, terrible and fearful. To his remnant, those people who have responded to his call by calling on him, remember, looking up, that's talking about he is the shelter and the strength for those. It's almost like a wing and being able to shelter those that are seeking as the remnant that he's called. Okay? Jerusalem isn't just the earthly capital of Israel. But it's also the, the purified city where God dwells with his people. So in other words, he's going to meet us in the clouds, the new Jerusalem. And uh, no judgment and cleansing will come by the Lord. So it's a beautiful description of what, the, what Joel is saying, is that the nations have turned away. They've gone to Babylon. They've gone to all the places that have been uh, worshipping idols and, and doing their own, own thing and uh, not, not acknowledging the Lord in the process 
people turning away from him just uh, outright. And this is a beautiful uh, opportunity for, for, for the prophecy of Joel through the book that we're reading at. Before we go into the next, uh, the next uh, phase that we're going to be looking at, it speaks about the opportunity for people to come back home, for people to come back to the Lord, so that he may be able to uh, remove the judgment and give the grace and the mercy that's available for each and every one of us. But we can't do that unless we make the decision to turn back to him and keep our eyes focused on him. Remember Habakkuk, he looked at the situations around him. It wasn't pleasant. It wasn't pleasant at all. But he kept his eyes on the Lord and he said to the Lord, Why, Lord? I'm seeking you for the answers. And that's where it comes in Matthew 6.33, which is shortly after the Lord's Prayer. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness shall be added unto you. So I want to encourage you, as we close off this little section of Joel, that it, it talks about the opportunity to come back into his loving arms. And I want to encourage you, make that commitment to turn around and come back into his loving arms so that he may be able to be glorified and working in through you through the Holy Spirit. So, let's look at the next opportunity that we've got to look at today. This is now the continuation of Acts. And uh, last, uh, last week we, we spoke about Peter and his, uh, his sermon, which uh, brought so many people into the kingdom. We're going to look at today uh, more into uh, chapter 2, verses 40, and we're going to read from 40 to 47. And this one is about uh, the vital church growing. And I want to encourage you that once we turn back up and keep him as our focus, get into a body of believers, the body of Christ, to be able to equip each other, uh, to equip the saints, as to say, uh, that will give us an opportunity to allow and walk in what it says in the word about the vital church growing. So let's take it from verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be safe from this perverse generation. And then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And the day about 3,000 souls were added to him, uh, to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all of those believed were there together, and all had things in common. So they sold possessions and goods and divided them amongst all and anyone who had a need. So continually, daily, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and ate their food with gladness and simplicity of their heart, praising God and having favor with all people, and that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So I want to just stop at the, at the end of 47, and I want to read a couple of things here. There's a, there's, there's, there's a few things that I'd like to read. First one is a word wealth. Okay? Let's look at the word wealth of fellowship. Think about things that have happened in your life where you've been able to fellowship with people. Okay, Fellowshipping with people that are uh, believers and uh, want the best for you and want to equip you and want uh, to be able to see the Lord working in and through you. But let's have a look at what it says in this word wealth. Okay, It says that it's a unity, close association, partnership, participation, a society, a communion, a fellowship, contribution to help. Uh, the, the brotherhood and Canonia uh, 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 is a unity brought about by the Holy Spirit in Canonia uh, the individual shares in common an intimate bond of fellowship with the rest of the Christian society Canonia cements the believers to the Lord Jesus Christ and each other so this is the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit wanting to be able to honor each and every person uh, that, that is uh, in, the, in the body of Christ looking out for their best interests and uh, wanting to fellowship with them. And that's where it's so important. When you give your life back to the Lord and when you take those steps to, as it says in the Bible, all those people that were added through the baptism, which is uh, so critical, um, it gives us the opportunity to fellowship, to fellowship, to break bread, to uh, see how we're doing, be there for one each other, encourage. When one falls down, we help them up. And uh, when there's uh, decisions such as uh, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, we can turn to each other and uh, through the body of Christ hold each other accountable for the, the body of Christ's best interests. And let's look at a kingdom dynamic which is also fellowship and this it talks about what I've been saying about the power of unity and it's the first detailed description of the early Christians is wonderfully revealing the followers of Jesus who had been baptized by the Holy Spirit literally devoted themselves to communication and unity with God and with each other in relationship to God, they continued continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, which is the Word of God, and in prayer. In relationship to one another, they devoted themselves to fellowship and to breaking of bread. 
As the word wealth article in this passage states, the word kononia literally denotes a deep sense of spiritual unity, of spiritual communion with the Lord and with each other. With the coming of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the priorities of the followers of Christ focused upon the spiritual unity with their Lord and with the brothers and sisters in Christ, within the church, the spiritual body of Christ. Every true Christian is a member of the body of Christ and is related to Christ and to the other believers as a member of that body. This is the essence of the true spiritual unity, the unity of the Spirit. I can say that there's been a number of times where that has been so beneficial to be able to break bread and uh, be there for one another. That surpasses uh, all understanding and knowledge on how the Holy Spirit works within the body of Christ. And until you be able to uh, be part of that uh, fellowship, it's difficult for you to be able to understand what I'm reading. But once you partake and experience it for yourself, it will bring more revelation once you read the Word, and not just my, my words, because I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm reading from the Word. So, you know, find, find what the Holy Spirit is saying to you once you start walking with the body of Christ and with the believers. And my, my, from my experience, it's, it's there to comfort, to exhort, as we've learned in the last little while about the Holy Spirit, which also grows you as a person, which is the next kingdom dynamic that I want to go into talks about uh, God's power ministry okay the spirit is engaged in some kind of activities and those in the early church so this is not something that we're looking at just in the last couple of months or, or, or years it talks about that we may be, be a kind of people who can consistently announce in body and demonstrate the kingdom of God the early church leaders d described the walk with God in terms of the athletic endeavor so you know if you want to run a race and <laughs> I've I've done that and you need the preparation to be able to get to the finish line you need some perseverance you need some training you need some uh, chutzpah if you want to call it that and um, it, it, you need to build your muscle to be able to withstand that distance that marathon that you're going to be running all that walk that you're going to be walking and uh, in this context it's talking about when it refers to the professional ath athletes building up muscle it also talks about uh, we, we, we can't do anything without God but it does talk about when we do the investment into our spiritual muscle and maximize God's investment in us through the word and through fellowship and being unified in the body of Christ, it gives us the basics of the, 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 the three elements, which is the word, fellowship and prayer. And sharing these together, caring for each other, giving your time, giving whatever it is that you're able to give, and also to be able to praise, worship and evangelize bring people into the body of Christ because once you experience the, the fullness of what the Lord is doing through the church you'll know that you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit in truth and in power uh, but that can only come through your decision to follow or go deeper through the word through worship and prayer so those are just lovely little uh, nuggets which then leads us on to the next part and I'd like to emphasize that this this is a very uh, important part to uh, emphasize because we've looked at from Joel we've looked at how uh, the Lord wants to have his people return to Israel to him because the Lord loves Israel he, 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 he longs for Israel and uh, even though he's doing a work in Israel he's still wanting his more you know his people to come back to him and that doesn't necessarily only talk about those in Israel it talks about the Jews and Gentiles the, uh, the spirit will be uh, poured out amongst all flesh so this is our opportunities uh, to come back to him as Jews or as Gentiles to be able to receive his love and then be baptized in, the, in, the, in, in water and in Holy Spirit so that he may be able to continue to grow us in maturity. And no one's perfect. We're all journeying along, doing the best that we are able to do to be able to bring fullness to the body of Christ. But here comes the next bit that I want to talk about. And this is taken from 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, verses uh, let's have a look we're going to take it from 1 Corinthians 12 verses 12 last week we looked at uh, the, the, we, we looked at uh, the spiritual the gifts which is unity and diversity now we're going to look at the universe we've looked at the unity and diversity now we're going to look at unit unity and diversity in one body so last week it was just appreciating our different gifts and skills and abilities now we're looking at how they can actually work together 
to be able to build the body of Christ and give glory to the Lord. So let's take it from verses 12 uh, through to... We're going to take it the whole... 12, uh, chapter 12, verses 12, all the way to the end. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, also is Christ. For by one spirit we are baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all have been made to drink into one spirit. And drink means in, is to uh, enter his presence, enter his presence with rest and thanksgiving, so that we may be able to be filled. Imagine a cup. Imagine if I should have brought a cup with me. But imagine a cup and I filled it with water and it was topped up. But I didn't top it up with the word of God through prayer and worship. That cup would probably, I'd be drinking from it. I'd be drinking from it, but then it would become empty. So what would happen if it's empty? Then I'm, I'm depleted. I haven't got much to give, okay, in terms of the spiritual sense. But when you have a drink, and then you have a drink in His presence, you rest in His presence, you, you be present in His presence, it allows you to be able to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because that's what He wants to do. So in, in, in the physical terms in this example, the cup is then topped up with that water, which then takes it back to the full level so that you may be able to drink. But you know what? He wants to fill it so that it overflows. And when it overflows, the powerful ministry that you'll be able to have because He's given it to you from on high, you'll be able to share it with everybody else and impart His love to those people that are so desperately needing to know Him. And, and the, 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 the anointing of the Holy Spirit will fall upon the others, just like it did with Peter and so many others. Okay, let's carry on. For in fact, the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not of an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, would there be any hearing? If the whole body, if the whole were hearing, would there be any smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would, be, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't have need for you. Nor again the head to the feet, saying I have no need for you. No matter, no matter uh, those members of those body which seems to be weaker are necessary. So what it's saying is that even though sometimes someone may be weaker, it doesn't negate to say that they're not needed in, in the body of Christ. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresent, uh, unpresentable parts have greater modesty. So in other words, it's equaling things. It's saying that the weak are still strong, and those that are strong are, not, are, 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 are to be modest. Okay? But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it, and that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, and var uh, varieties of tongues. Are, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all, gifts, uh, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But I earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you more in a, a more excellent way. So this is now talking about the gifts of healing, the apostles, and uh, actually the interdependence that we all have for each other. So let's have a look at another kingdom dynamic now. Let's have a look at the, the interdependence. You know, it's quite important to understand this concept. So I'm going to take a little bit of time here. Independence says I can do it by myself. So in other words, I don't need you. I can do it by myself. That's independence. Interdependence says I cannot do it alone. We need each other. So in other words, it's saying I need you because I can't do it by myself. And there's been lots of times, and I'm sure you'll be able to uh, reflect back on times that you've persevered in something that the Lord has called you to do or even just in your daily walk, daily life whether it be working, raising a family, 
or uh, running a business or a church or whatever it may be okay when you are doing it in your own strength that's when there might be a bit of a problem but when you call on the body of Christ to be able to work together that's where the interdependency comes along because that will then mature and grow the body of Christ and be more effective through uh, each, each one of us callings because remember we're not all eyes we're not all ears we're not all feet okay the goal of interdependence in the church and amongst the churches is to reflect the unity of the body of Christ in the midst of its diversity so we are different everyone's different if we we're all the same life would be boring okay God has gifted different parts of the body including different congregations with spe specific missions to build up the whole as the body function in, in God's intended way, he uses it to draw the alienated people of various circumstances to the good news of Jesus Christ. Interdependence is difficult to develop in a culture that in, insists on its own way and rights. But to minister uh, reconcili reconciliation, we must learn it. In interdependent living, we learn to appreciate the uniqueness of the other and, and to, to a need that what others bring to the relationship. And this is a reciprocal equality that described in the 2 Corinthians 8 verses 12 to 14 where one's abundance supplies is what the other lacks leading to a mutual benefiting of each other's inter interdependence supplies even supplying its different needs balancing the whole so remember we spoke about the weakness and the strong and being able to pass on the strength to the weakness and maybe those people in the weakness have strength that that hasn't been recognized by anybody else that could actually balance the body of Christ so why I'm emphasizing on this is because you know I, I can speak from experience and personal revelation of you know wanting to uh, uh, do my part what I believe the call is, is what the Lord has asked me to do um, but I know that I can't do it alone and also see if you have a look at relationships you know that we're not the same we, we all have our differences and sometimes that can cause conflict because you can't even see each other from our, our, our independent point of views but that's the key that's that's looking at from independent but if we look at it from an interdependent saying okay I, I recognize what you're saying what, what you're saying uh, can bring uh, life to to what I'm trying to do and in turn what I am skilled at or what I interpret my beliefs to be may be able to help you so we're looking at not only just a physical helping and building up of the body of Christ but a spiritual understanding and so that we all go deeper and deeper into the rela relationship with Christ but if we cut off from that and we don't acknowledge that that's an opportunity for us to grow then that's where it becomes an independent thing where it's like I can do it I don't need you I'm gonna go you know do it in my own strength and, and that, that causes problems because we, we know we can't do everything in our own strength we do need each other so whilst I appreciate the, the argument of being inter independent, you can't negate the, the reality and, and the fruitfulness of interdependent that, that, that relationships can bring. And that's my prayer is that, you know, even in your own relationships with your husband, with your wife, with your work colleague, uh, you know, with, with those in, in the congregation or fellowship, if you have your differences, yes, that's what God made us unique. He made us unique to have our differences. So instead of looking at the dirt in each other, Let's look at the gold in each other so that we may be able to take all the pieces of gold that are all scattered around through the body of Christ, bring them up into a place of maturity so that the Lord can get the present, the, 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 the honor and the glory. So it's, it's important to also uh, refer to uh, verses 28 where it says God has appointed these in the church. And this talks about the apostles, etc., etc. The word wealth that I want to go through here is apostles. And the apostles are... It's a bit of an argument with, with believers and non-believers alike because uh, some, some view apostles as history. They, they were there, but they're not here anymore. But if I try and explain to you in my layman's terms, um, but please, you know, do your own research and, and, uh, and, and let me know what you come up with. But from my interpretation of the apostles is the apostles are really, it's not a, it's, it's a very challenging job because the apostles are there to send out and to equip and to uh, work through the church and through the communities and to be there for all the different uh, facets of life so it's not an easy position or office if you want to call it to be able to uh, to 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 work in or to be called to but if you are called to it 
then that's the Lord's calling on your life. But let's have a look at the word wealth here. It says a special, a special messenger, a delicate, one commissioned for a particular task or role, one who is sent forth with a message. In the New Testament, the word denotes both the original 12 disciples and prominent leaders outside the 12. Marvin Vincent records three features of an apostle. Number one, one who has a visible encounter with the resurrected Christ. Number two, one who plants churches. Number three, one who functions in the ministry with signs, wonders and miracles. I'm just asking you to, to, to let that soak in for a second. Apostles being the ones that are uh, have, have had the encounter with the Lord Jesus. And you know what, if you've had an encounter with the Lord Jesus, you know that. No one can actually ever take that away from you. Um, the, the, the one who, who, who plants churches, and that's growing, growing the, the church, growing the body of Christ. Um, taking the lead role in, in wanting to be able to uh, plant those churches so that the congregation can come give praise, worship, and be equipped for the saints, okay, for ministry. And then also just to be able to function with the ministry uh, and, and with signs, wonders and miracles. Let's have a look at another one. Just another little last one that I want to look at with Kingdom Dynamics. We've gone through a couple which is quite exciting. But let's have a look at another one. The gifts of healing. Remember we've spoken about a couple of uh, uh, gifts that the Lord, the nine gifts that the Lord gives, uh, gives, to, uh, gives to us. You know, those are special gifts that we can grow into. It's not like we only have one and we don't have the other the other eight. We, we're working towards maturing in all of those gifts and the Lord will highlight which one that he may want you to uh, pour out or he may want to do a work in within you. But let's have a look at the gifts of healing. In order that the church's mission might not be limited to the abilities of mere human in, uh, enterprise, the Holy Spirit provides special designed, distributed and energized gifts. Among them are gifts of healing. The clear intent is that the supernatural healing of the sick should be a permanent ministry established in the church alongside abetting the work of evangelizing the world. This is for today. It's for today, not yesterday or tomorrow. It's for today. It's timeless. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So that is saying to us that the gifts of, of, of healing and Please uh, allow me to explain this without um, uh, putting anything else on a second level. But with the gifts of healing, it's coming from the Holy Spirit. So sometimes if we are injured or we are ill, yes, we need the medical attention. Or we may need the, the, the dose of medicine to get us through that period. But sometimes, the, 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 there's, there's, well not sometimes, all the times there's, there's a spiritual healing that needs to take place so that the body can be fully restored and if anybody's been ill you probably understand what i'm talking about because sometimes the medication might not take away the illness maybe that's something that the lord wants to do through you in and through you spiritually so that you can be healed from the inside out because the spiritual element is a very important element of healing and that is something that we all walk through well i can't say all but i would encourage you that if you are have been hurt or been ill uh, don't negate the, the power of, of the gifts of healing through prayer, laying on hands and, and just praying for the person. I've been through personal testimonies where I've had struggles with my, with my body and I've had healing and I've had a season of breakthrough where there's been total healing which is unexplainable because there was no medicine involved. Um, but then I've also been in circumstances where I've been medicated and there ha still hasn't been healing. So I'm not saying one's more important than the other. I'm saying that the spiritual healing is a very powerful thing and that's where the, the, the ministry and the body of Christ in the church is there. Is to, you know, like if you're going to a doctor or you're going to a hospital, you're going there to get the, the bone put back into place, okay? But you also need the, the, the praying, the laying on hands to be able to bring the Lord into the situation so that He can cement that healing and bring glory to God. And it may, even if it doesn't happen overnight and it takes a, a long season or a short season, you're still being obedient to the call that the Lord has asked you to uh, come forward and, and, and be prayed for, to be healed. So, very interesting about the different uh, 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 apostles, prophets, teachers and, and healers and, and all that that comes into it. So let's recap here for a second, just before we finish off. 
We are called to be united. We're called to be united, but we live in a world at the moment that appears to be very divided. We see all the riots going on all over the world, and we've actually just been talking about this recently. And it keeps taking me back to the book of Habakkuk where things were not right around him and he, he, still, he still looked at the Lord. And I want to encourage you, we're going through a season globally, not just individually or in our family or community or business, wherever it may be. We're looking at a global uh, season of being uh, divided in, in certain senses. If you look at the riots that are going on, just as an example, you look at the... Um, the, 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 the illness that's come from this coronavirus that's causing things to be uh, shaken to be unsettled and to perhaps maybe bring fear but we are called not to uh, live in fear the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear but he's given us a spirit of love power and sound mind because the Lord Jesus said himself in Matthew 24 I'm just going to go back here quickly Matthew 24 does talk about that there will be things that will come and uh, for nations will rise up against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms and there will be famines pestilences earthquakes in various places and all these are the beginnings of sorrows then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my sake and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many and because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this is the gospel of the kingdom and will be preached to in all the world as witnesses to the nations. And then the end will come. These are the words of Jesus that he spoke in the book of Matthew. And he spoke about the destruction of the temple. Remember they said, we're going to, he said, break down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. This is a temple that took them so long to build and they thought he was talking about the, the physical temple. Remember he was talking about his spiritual temple. So let's refer this back to us. When we're talking about our spiritual temple, what are you doing to be able to rebuild your spiritual temple? Is it, is it, is it in prayer, worship and, and re getting into the word uh, after being baptized or once you've been baptized then be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Or is it a case of turning to the world and it's... Uh, and it's, and it's uh, fruitless uh, 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 gifts that it may give you okay yes we've still got to be on the earth and we still got to do what we feel that the Lord has called us to do whether it's in ministry whether it's in uh, the, the the workplace or whether it be in our own family homes or even individually these are the things that the call the Lord has called us to do but I want to ask you I want to challenge you I want I want to put this to you and I want you to think about this over the next week it's just think about what what the Lord has asked you to do are you are you purifying your temple so that you may be a blessing to yourself and others and to him more importantly let's have a look at one last thing which i wanted to touch on it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a an eye opener and i just want to um read chapters uh, revelation chapter four and i'm just going to read um verses one to four I just feel that the lord is asking me to read this after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying come up here and I will show you things which must, must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and the sardius stone in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne and appeared like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white robes, and and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Sure. Yeah. It's it, the door standing open in heaven is a door of the prophetic um, revelation. And the first voice is the voice of the Lord Christ saying, summoning John to come up in order that he may receive a heavenly perspective of things which must take place. John did not record the events in chronological order, but he did say that the, re the, the, the reoccurrence after these things and such phrases as, and I saw, then I was, and now a great sign, refers to the sequence of John's receiving them. So John, as we can, receive prophetic downloads from the Lord and from the Holy Spirit that will allow us to see things, which is why you had the prophets, the majors and the minors, 
and why you, why the Lord allows that person to view what's to come. But that is to bring a message of either asking people to return and repent, change your thinking, change your mindset, to be able to walk in the freedom of the Lord, or it may be a, 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 for a specific, a specific event. Okay, and these are the things that the Lord has given us to bless us. But let's have a look. It says further on. Um, let's have a look at the, the interpretation. It, it actually talks about uh, John's hearing a trumpet and being asked to come up to the throne and uh, catching away of the church prior to the Great Tribulation. This is quite a, this is quite a challenging topic to talk about because while, while we looked at Matthew, what Jesus said in Matthew, about the pestilences, we've seen the locusts up in Africa, North Africa, it's happening right now. We've seen all the, 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 the illness in terms of this coronavirus and, as, and he said these things are going to come where the, the moon will turn to blood and will there be earthquakes and pestilences, etc, etc. But what I want to say to you is that this is now talking about the Great Tribulation. And I'm, I'm starting to understand why the Lord led me to this, to this verse now. Okay, the interpretation is the church's departure to heaven at this point. And as the reason that the, the, the word church does not appear again until the end of Revelation, which is the end of the book. And alternative uh, views of the timing of the raptures are noted further on in, in, in Revelation. Why I feel the Lord has led me to that is because we've just today walked through a journey of the, 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 the Lord wanting the people to come back to Him so that He can uh, dwell in Zion and, and protect them and keep them. And uh, then it's through to the book of Acts where you know, it talks about uh, bringing uh, the, the vital church growing. And then it talks about the Chronicles, about the diff uh, sorry, Corinthians, not Chronicles. Corinthians talking about the, the, the differences, the unity and diversity in one body, one body. So in other words, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But then we're now looking at revelations. And this, I think, sums up the whole sermon for today. Is that the Lord is wanting us to make sure that we are staying attuned to Him, staying attuned to His love and abiding in Him. Because it says, you can abide in me and I'll abide in you. John says it in the book. And he says, to, and he says it for a reason. It's because there's going to be a great tribulation. And the tribulation is a whole study on its own. And I'm going to send through a couple of links uh, for, for you. Or if you want to know more about it, I'll certainly point you into a good Bible teaching that explains more about it. But why I'm sharing this with you is because we, haven't, we may not have long to go. Because it says in the Word, you do not know the hour that I will be coming. But I will come through the swift of night. So in other words, let get, let's get ourselves prepared. Because the bride, he's coming for his bride, spotless. He wants his bride spotless. And this is where I'm going to close off. By saying that the Lord wants to do a good work through us. He wants to, he wants to pour out his, his love on us. He wants to get us ready for his second coming. But there's going to be a tribulation. There's going to be a time where there's going to be, things are going to get worse. And things are not going to get any easier. And this sums up the whole book of, of, from Genesis to Revelation. But we're going to go dig it in, into it deeper so that we can truly get the revelation of what the Lord says to us, both corporately and individually during our quiet time. So I just want to close off by saying thank you for listening to this message. I, I wish I could carry on, but I know that our time is, um, is limited uh, because we've got uh, our daily um, tasks that we, that we take care of. But we're going to go into deeper studies. And I just want to encourage you through... Um, the, 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 from the beginning, the word of Genesis right through to Revelation get yourself a Bible, even if it's online get into the word get your heart right, remember we said render your heart to the Lord so that he may be able to do a good work in you my prayer is that you be able to understand the full love that the Lord has for you, through the baptism of water and the Holy Spirit, but he needs you because, you know what we can't without him, and without us he won't and I just want to encourage you, as we close off, have a listen to the word again. Have a listen to the opportunities that he keeps on reminding us and telling us through all the prophets and Jesus himself and through the disciples and the apostles afterwards who went with the word, spreading it to the world so that they'd be able to know the love of Christ. And there's, there's still an opportunity for them to come back into his loving arms before the church is being removed. Because it talks about the, the, the removal of, of so that the lawless one can can take over and as i'm learning as i'm growing i'm learning about the the the, the, the removal of the holy spirit from the church etc i don't want to go into that too much because i've got i've got a good link that will be able to help you identify and understand the true meaning of all of this 
So while we close off today, it talks about uh, the love of the Lord, talks about the, the verses that bring us into the closer relationship, and also talks about what's coming. And I want to ask you, now more than ever, as I always do, <laughs> seriously, commit your ways to the Lord and He will direct your paths. Give Him your life. Give Him your life, undivided attention, and just give Him your, your 100% so that you can grow in intimacy with Him and others. Because in Matthew, it says, Seek you first. No, that's Matthew 6.33. The other one is talking about the greatest commandment. Love your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. And love your neighbors as yourself. So as we close off with that little verse, Matthew 22, 22 33, 37 to 41, I want to give thanks to the Lord. Thank you, Father God, for allowing us to be able to meditate on your word, to be able to bring back remembrance of what you say in your scripture, which we've been able to do. Lord, even though your word is stern, and even though it does say repent and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I ask that you impregnate this within each and every person that listens to the message, this message, and give them the revelation that no one else can give them about what you want to do in and through them. So, Father God, as we close off today, I just want to ask that the Lord bless you and keep you, everybody who's listening to this message. And Lord, thank you for shining your face upon us and giving us your love, Lord. Help us to be united. Help us to turn back to you and help your vital church to grow. Because we need you, Lord. Because we need you. So, Heavenly Father, I give you thanks and praise and glory in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Sure, guys, that was quite a session. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for uh, hearing the word. And I hope it's been an encouragement to all of you. I hope that you'll be able to go deeper. And I hope that the Lord will be able to give you such a love that cannot be understood that you will be able to be the light in a dark place. Because that's what we're called to be, is a light in a dark place. And you know what? Let's do it interdependently working together in unity filling and, and and equipping the body of christ but for his glory so great to see you again be encouraged for the week this week we're going to be delving into a good number of topics so stay tuned and sending love to you and all take care for now bye bye